Today, the whole river is called Penobscot. The people are called Penobscot. You'd pronounce it Bernawepskek, and we're Bernawepskewi, which means we are the people of a place. These are our ancestral waterways, and that river perspective and river view is something that our whole history can be synthesized down to. We are the people of this river. We had an elder in our community, his name is Charles Norman Shea, and he was cleaning out his old family house and he was in the garage and he found this old photograph of his mother when she was probably 18 or 19 years old. I realized that she had a collar on, like a traditional ceremonial collar. That's a very important piece of regalia for our community. There were a lot of really elaborate and beautiful collars, and they're symbolic. You know, it's the weight of responsibility on their shoulders. Not only did I realize that she had this collar on, I recognized the collar. And it was a collar that was held by the Smithsonian. When I go to a museum, I am elated and happy and excited. And then I'm also like really, really sad and devastated at the same time. You know, museums and tribes, it's such a loaded thing and it's so, um, it's not black and white and it's not easy. They're housing them, but they belong to us and they always will, no matter who owns them. <laughs> this collar was actually purchased from a woman named Ada Sockabason. And Charles was like, oh, that's our next door neighbor. Ada had sold it to what are called commercial ethnographers, a company called Covert and Harrington. Covert and Harrington would go around to these communities at a time when it was believed that we were going to become extinct and buy up a lot of cultural heritage items for pennies on the dollar. Earlier anthropology was motivated by a very colonial belief that indigenous people's cultures were disappearing. They were often being forced to disappear by making certain cultural practices illegal. So there was this sort of push-pull where the colonial governments were basically forcing indigenous people to stop practicing their culture at a time when anthropologists then showed up and were trying to document these quote-unquote disappearing cultures. The rivers were dammed up and you couldn't spear salmon. The landscape had changed and so someone turns up and has cash and tells you they're gonna keep it safe and protect it. That's the kind of path that this caller took from Ada Saka Basin to Covert in Harrington on behalf of George Hay and became part of the collection of the National Museum of American Indian, the Smithsonian. It's so much more than an object to us, you know, it's our culture and, and the thing is, we didn't disappear. We're still here. It feels like so much has been taken away. How do we reckon around what we've lost and how do we heal through it? And it is through this possibility, right, of gaining more control um, and, and reclaiming um, what is rightfully ours that creates those possibilities for the whole panoply of everything that has been about taking from us. Charles, as soon as he found out, 
well, I want it back. <laughs> and I says, well, that's a little more difficult than just you wanting it back. It was sold and it was a legal transaction and that's that. So the next best thing is let's just make it. Let's just recreate it and bring it back that way. He had the means to actually hire uh, artists within the community to travel to DC, to study the collar, um, and then to recreate that collar for him. Every drawer that I pulled out, I was just like, oh my gosh, you know, just like amazed at what they had. It was really inspiring and it was really sad at the same time. Like the dance rattles, like I would dream about them after. I just wanted to pick it up and like sing a song with it. It felt like it was lonely, like those things, you know, they have their own life and their own power. And so to be there with them was like really moving and, and just like a ton of different emotions. <laughs> This will be the hardest thing I've ever made by far. It's a big, big project, but I was really happy and excited to do it. And if I can make something kind of reappear in our community, then I think that's a really good thing. You know, the more people that can see these old pieces and old styles, I think it just makes us stronger as people. And, you know, to remind ourselves about these beautiful things that our ancestors made. When she finished the collar, we had a press conference and she opened the box and it was just, it radiated. It was so beautiful and new. The only thing that was more amazing was when she put it on him. A wave of energy went through the room and made the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. It still makes me cry to talk about it. Even though that wasn't the collar from the early 1800s and it wasn't the one, it was almost like the power of that collar came home and the energy of that came home with us. And I realized in that moment that out of all the collars that I had seen, I had never seen anybody have one put on their body. And it was just an amazing moment uh, in the history of our tribe. It really synthesized like a path for me. You know, the history of the extraction of our cultural heritage items from our community to someplace else has happened. How do we move forward is the tact I need to take. It's my job to help others share our collective history. Our main goal today is to get digital items of absolutely everything. All Penobscot items that are in institutions across this country and around the world need to come home, at least digitally, so we can put them in front of Penobscot people. There's like a spiritual connection, but also like pride of who you are and how strong and how beautiful your ancestors are. And if you can't see that, it makes everything more difficult, I think. following sentences are in English with the equivalent translation in the Penobscot dialect. Frank Siebert was a linguist who worked with the Penobscot Nation over about a 40-year period. I had met Jane a couple of years um, before we ran into a, a language issue in our community. I got a call from James and he asked me for some help in relationship to ownership of the Penobscot language. Dr. Seabird created our Penobscot dictionary and compiled a lot of information while doing that. When he died in 1998, the word lists and the dictionary and all the field notes that he had went to the American Philosophical Society, not to the Penobscot Nation. So my job became a little bit of a legal forensic work to determine how it was that 
Siebert had become the legal rights holder over the Penobscot language. How is it that someone came, listened to our ancestors, wrote it down, published a book about it, and now suddenly they're the holders of our language? A lot of people say, well, how can you own a language? You own a language when you write a language down, when you record a language. And if there aren't very many speakers of that language left, that becomes held and owned by the third party who wrote it down. We don't own the legal ownership of those, but they're certainly part of our culture. We were simultaneously thinking about other mechanisms or other tools that could make sure that Penobscot interests and Penobscot authority could always stay with that material. This led to the development of the labels as a particular kind of intervention. We have this real thirst to control, collect, and be in charge of how our culture, especially our language, is um, managed for our community's well-being. These TK labels allow us to assert our voice in those institutions about our cultural heritage items. In the American Philosophical Society, the collection is, of course, under Frank Siebert's name. And so the Penobscot Nation want to utilise the attribution label so that Penobscot name is in the catalogue, not as a subject, but as a kind of author and as having certain kinds of authorial rights. The authority of an institution to say this is what this is, is really strong. And to kind of break that authority of an institution or of a non-Indigenous researcher, to actually allow for multiple voices, you know, that's what kind of the radical proposition of what the labels do. For example, with basketry, all of the Wabanaki tribes make ash and sweetgrass baskets. There are certain styles that you can attribute to a tribe. But then also you can go further and say, this is a Penobscot basket and it was, this style was made by the Attian family or the Francis family or the Neptunes. Having that level of detail is really important and valuable for us, but also to that institution. Their knowledge is built as well and it always travels with that object. It's there, it's living there, but we as Penobscots are still responsible for that, that it gets cared for and that it doesn't lose its identity or who it is or why it's important. <laughs> Penobscot people get to be the authority. <laughs> After a decade of focused collaboration, officials from the University of Maine and the Penobscot Nation took a major step forward this afternoon. They signed a memorandum of understanding, formalizing the work they've done to manage the tribe's cultural heritage. Officials say among the goals of the agreement will be integrating the tribe's perspective into research processes and implementing Penobscot language on signage on campus. With a land acknowledgement, we needed more permanence to the fact that this is Penobscot homeland, hence the signage work, right? That gives all people who walk across campus, even if they don't really know what they're seeing, they kind of know what they're seeing, and it shifts their understanding of the place. Here's the internal sign. It's literally a transfer of authority, not all the way, where this isn't uh, exactly about repatriating and giving everything back, but it is a, a form of intellectual repatriation. It takes us telling the story, it takes us sharing the perspective. It has to be done um, often in one-on-one -on -one experiences directly with Indigenous people saying, you know, you're hurting me by, by doing the thing that you continue to do. 
by recognizing a kind of role and responsibility in our territory. The University of Maine knows that it, it has certain kind of duties and responsibilities. And I think, you know, to me, that's us pulling them into our cultural sort of frame. A lot of this work is about correcting past mistakes, but also giving Penobscot Nation more control over our, our heritage items as well. I think in the last few years, there's been a uptick of people wanting to start to grapple with uh, the history of this country and they're more apt to listen to our voice today and they're willing to be a little more accommodating. Here we go. So I have photo albums right here. That's Francis Stanislaus. Here's Francis Stanislaus and then also I have these ones. I'm, it might be an older version of the same person, I'm not sure. And I think these clothes I have, the pants and the shirt, I believe. And then underneath here, I have the leggings as well. Okay, so there it is. So this is, that's the suit too. I've compared okay. I've the, the pictures with him at the bow and arrow yeah, holder. No. It's, it's the same. The Hudson Museum has digitized the Penobscot collections as well as the Abbey Museum in Maine. This will give us stories of those items, enhancing our own history, but it also will enhance their collections, those institutions, as we correct misinformation about those items. So it's a, a symbiotic relationship. For hundreds and thousands of years, my um, ancestors have been, you know, tromping around sort of wetland areas like this near rivers and taking the best ash trees to make baskets out of. Our ancestors were able to survive because they knew how to prepare this tree to make baskets and how to go to the coast and pick sweet grass. And, you know you have this strong cultural background you can draw on and you have ancestors that have your back and always will. That's traditional knowledge and it is something that is vital for the survival of a distinct, unique people.